Good morning and welcome to Greater Hope Church Online. Uh, my name is Stan McMahon and I'm the pastor of Greater Hope. Uh, we're really glad that you've decided to join us today, whether it's for your first time or whether you've been joining us week by week. Uh, we want more than anything for the good news of Jesus, the gospel, to be clear to everybody who watches this, uh, this service this morning. And the gospel gives us a reason to rejoice, a reason to hope, a reason to sing. Uh, I know it's not Christmas time, but there's a really famous Christmas hymn, Christmas song called Joy to the World. I know you've heard of it. And there's a line in there that says, Jesus came to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. He makes his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. That means that the good news of Jesus is not only good news for every person, it's good news for your family, it's good news for your business, it's good news for your community, it's good news for our nation. Uh, Jesus can heal uh, everything that's wrong with this world. And so we're, we're glad that you've joined us this morning and we hope that message comes out loud and clear. If you want to keep up with uh, what we're doing at Greater Hope, you can go to our website, uh, greaterhopemulberry.org, and uh, there you can subscribe to our update email. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Not only are we doing announcements there, but we're trying to put out uh, weekly content to help you grow in your faith, uh, including some little mini-series that we've been doing. One called, uh, Where is God When I'm Hurting? And we're going to be uh, starting a new one this week on how to guard your heart. And so we would love to have you uh, keep up with us there. I know that as uh, we begin to uh, think about reopening uh, as a whole state, uh, we're going to be uh, talking and making some decisions about our services. So please stay tuned over this next week or two uh, as we try to come out with some announcements. We really want to be together in person again as soon as we can. Uh, well, today we're going to again send it out to some of the members of Greater Hope who are going to help us with uh, scripture reading and with prayer. Uh, but thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, Greater Hope. Uh, my name is Clark, and I'll be leading us through parts of our worship this morning. Uh, we start with our call to worship, which is an opportunity for us to prepare our hearts to worship the King of Kings. So hear God's word as it's written in Psalm 40, verses 1 through 5. A Psalm of David. I wait patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. So let's continue our worship this morning uh, as we turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore you. Your mighty works are ever before us. You are creator, creator of all things. You are sustainer of life. For us, you lifted each of us out of the slimy pit. You placed our feet on a rock, and you gave us a new song in our hearts. You are our comforter our protector. You are our salvation. You are the lover of our souls, and Lord, we adore you. We know that you are the sovereign king of all. You are in full control of all things. You are in control of COVID-19. You are in control of the sickness and the health. You are in control of the ups and downs of the economy. You're in control of the future. There are all these are all under your sovereign rule. Yet you came down to the earth to save just me and you. We confess we do not live like you are ruler of all things. We worry, we question your ways. We think we know better. We struggle in our homes and in our families. We fail to honor you. We blame others. We make excuses. We let the worries of the days control us. We fail to love one another. 
We get irritated being in such close proximity in our homes for so long. We ask that you would forgive us our sins, you would heal our families, our neighborhoods, our cities, our nation, and our world. Lord, would you clothe us with your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your gentleness, your faithfulness, and your self-control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now hear the good news from 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Now let's continue our worship this morning with our songs of praise. We are excited to worship with you this morning. Please sing out as we celebrate God. Behold the Father's heart, the mystery he lavishes on us. As deep cries out too deep, how desperately he wants us. Stand next to him like a candle to the sun. Unfailing Father, what compares to his great love? Behold his holy son. The lion and the lamb given to us. The word became a man that my soul should know its savior. Forsake it for the sake of all mankind. Salvation is in his blood. Spirit, 
Let your work in me be done. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul. How great your love is. How great your love is.
so I could walk right through it. My fears would drown in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears would drown in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. A child of God I am a child of God I am a child of God Good morning, Greater Hope family. We're so excited to see you this morning. I'm Tiffany McMahon. I'm Robert McMahon. And we want to read the scripture for you. Today's passage comes from Genesis 3, 8 through 15. This is God's word. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Have you ever thought about why quick fixes are so appealing? You know, it seems like when I'm in any kind of trouble or have any kind of difficulty, I'm always looking for the quickest fix. I don't want a lot of steps. I don't want something that takes a long time to fix the problem. I want the problem to be fixed now, right? There's a lot of appeal to it. But have you ever also noticed how quick fixes, although we run to them quickly, don't always end up delivering on what they promise? They're many times very disappointing. Uh, there's a, an old story, an ancient story, in fact, a legend about how uh, King Midas uh, wanted to fix all of his problems, and so he wished for the ability to make everything he touched turn into gold. And, And he got that wish. He began to touch everything, and everything became solid gold. He thought it was the quick fix to every problem in his life until he discovered that it wasn't a good thing when he touched his food, for example, for it to suddenly turn into solid gold. It wasn't a good thing for him to touch his loved ones, and then they suddenly turned into blocks of solid gold. You see, quick fixes generally don't get the job done. The verses that we read this morning in Genesis 3, especially verse 15 where we want to focus, these verses show us that in this messy world, and the world is, granted, full of all kinds of mess, uh, your life and my life also full of all kinds of mess, God has a plan, God has a fix But that fix is not quick. God makes a promise to Adam and Eve from the very beginning, right after the moment they have fallen into sin. God makes a promise that he's going to begin to work in a way that restores and redeems everything that they've lost because of their sin. And yet, it takes years, it takes thousands of years for that to come about. It's still coming about today. But I think if we pay special attention to Genesis 3.15, this promise that one day the offspring of Eve, one day the offspring of the woman is going to crush the snake's head, 
He's going to crush the head of, of Satan, the, the serpent that came into the garden and tempted the first man and woman away from God and towards themselves, towards sin. If we pay attention to that promise, and if we see Jesus as the ultimate fulfiller of it, we will be able to have an unshakable faith even in a shaky world. We've been talking about that over the past few weeks, and we're going to spend several more weeks on it. The early Christians uh, began to confess their faith by writing, among other things, what's called the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed says this about Jesus. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and he was born of the Virgin Mary. And I want to show you today from Genesis 3.15 that what that means is that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. He's the ultimate snake crusher who came into the world to make his blessings flow as far as the curse of sin and the curse of death, the curse of Satan, has gone. And so if we look at the verse, I want to pull out three very important things about God's plan, about this plan of the snake crusher. Uh, first of all, I want us to see the promise of the snake crusher. God is making a, a promise of the way that he's going to work in the world as a response to human sin. Secondly, I want us to see the arrival of the snake crusher, how only Jesus Christ can fulfill what's promised here in Genesis 3.15. And then finally, I want us to see the blessing of the snake crusher, uh, the way that your life and mine should be if we live by faith in this awesome promise. All right, so first of all, let's look at the promise itself. How does God say he's going to work to undo the mess that human sin has made? Well, you can notice there from the very beginning of the passage, clearly sin had made its mark very quickly on the world. Uh, there in verse 8, it says that the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from God among the trees of the garden. Now here, we begin to see what sin does to, to us, what, what it does to our lives. When it says they heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, uh, most Bible scholars and, and theologians point out that the way that it's said, the, the tense of the verb, makes it clear this is something Adam and Eve had experienced many times before. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden because they had walked with God in the garden before. Can you imagine that? What it would have been like to be in a garden that God had planted, an absolutely perfect paradise, and to have such uninterrupted fellowship with your maker that you were able to take an afternoon walk with him through that very garden. That was the routine that Adam and Eve experienced. But when sin came into the world, the first thing that happens is that sound of the Lord God becomes not a, a joy to their heart, it becomes a terror. The fellowship that they had with God is broken, and the same thing goes for you and me. The Bible makes this very clear. Everybody, everyone listening to this, has a relationship with God of some kind. We as humans are inescapably related to God. You can't get away from Him. The question, though, is what kind of relationship do we have with God? Do you see here what sin does to that relationship? It causes them to run away from God rather than to come towards Him. It causes them, it goes on to say there in, in verses 8 through 11, it causes them to hide from God. They hide because of shame. They realize that they're naked and they're ashamed of what they've done. They don't want to be seen by God. They don't want to be seen by each other. It also says there in verses 11 and following that when God begins to question them, uh, what have you done? Where are you at? Why have you done what I told you not to do? Immediately, the people begin to pass the blame down the line. Uh, the, one, the, the man blames the woman and God. The woman blames the snake, and then God comes in with a curse for all of them. The, the snake is cursed. The woman is cursed. The man is cursed. Do you see what sin does? Sin causes us to hide, to cover, to blame shift, and it brings on both the, the curse and the blessing of God. This is, what, this is what this is saying. This is very, very important for us to see. God is committed from the very beginning right here in the garden to work on fixing the world, but it's not a quick fix. It's a fix that's going to take a while. And it's a fix that does not compromise either his justice or his grace. God turns the volume up on both of those aspects of who he is. 
He turns the volume up on justice. He confronts the first man and woman. He pronounces a curse because of sin. And that's always true of God. You know, the reason why our world is so broken, why there's, why there's death, why there's all the other things that come along with death, is because God is continually expressing his justice against human rebellion. And he won't stop. The Bible says, even though we may think we get away with what we do, even though we may think other people get away with what, we, what they do, they do not. God's justice is relentless, and one day all wrongs will be righted by God. He cannot turn the volume down on his justice. But also, at the very same time, God does not turn down the volume on his grace. He goes to the man and woman and seeks them out. He doesn't have to do that. He could have left the man and woman in their misery, but he goes to them and begins to gently ask them questions. When he curses the snake and the man and the woman, we see that especially in verse 15, the, the verse we want to focus on this morning. When he curses the snake, inside the curse, inside the justice is a huge promise of grace. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and your seed and hers, talking to the snake or, or Satan. I'm going to start a war, God says. It's my war on sin. It's my war on evil and my war on Satan and death and all these other things that corrupt my world. But not only am I going to start a war, I'm going to make sure that war is won. And I'm going to share that victory with you. Even with this Adam and Eve, this first man and woman who very clearly are the whole reason why the world got to where it is in the first place. It was their fault. It was their sin and rebellion that got the world there. And yet God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to share my victory with you. You see it? God does not turn down the volume on his justice. And he does not turn down the volume of, on his grace. He turns both volumes up. Two different instruments playing two different tunes. But like in a symphony, they harmonize together beautifully in the plan of God. The agenda of God to fix the world. And I want you to see how different that is than the way you and I think the way you and I think this world or our lives could be fixed. I mean Adam and Eve really do show us, don't they, the way we always respond to the problems of life. We hide, we cover. We turn in on ourselves. Uh, we turn down the volume either of justice or of grace, one or the other. That's what we tend to do. I mean think about even back to childhood. What did you do when you got caught doing something that you knew you weren't supposed to do? I mean, all of us had basically the same uh, knee-jerk reaction. I remember one time when I was in, in first grade, we were out at PE taking laps, and the one rule out taking laps at PE was don't kick over the orange cones. And there I was, you know, six-year-old Stan, running around. There was a, a girl beside me, a friend that I wanted to impress. And so, boom, I kicked the cone as hard as I could kick it. It went flying across the field. I thought I was special. I thought I had done something to really impress her. Later on, when the coach gathered us together, I didn't know this, but the coach had seen me do it. He had seen me disobey the one rule that he had. And so he began to ask, just like God in this story, who did this? Even though he knew, who did this? What did I do? The first thing I did is I lied. A lie just came out of me. I denied it, and I denied it, and I denied it. Once the, the coach finally confronted me and said, Stan, I know you did it. Just stop lying about it. I saw you do it. What did I do then? I began to confess with weeping. I mean, I cried big tears. I cried as if me admitting that meant my coach was going to hate me, my teachers were going to hate me and kick me out of school, my parents, when they found out, were going to kick me out of the house, six-year-old me out of the house. You see, you see what I was doing? Either I had to turn down the volume on justice and lie about what I had done and pretend like I was innocent, or I had to turn down the volume on grace when I was caught. I couldn't imagine that I could both be an offender and also at the same time still loved. And yet here, at the very first, uh, scholars call this verse the first gospel in the Bible. 
Genesis 3.15 is the first announcement of the good news of Jesus in the whole Bible. And there it says, God will not turn down the volume on justice and he will not turn down the volume on grace. He will find a way in history to bring those two things together and cause them to, to live in harmony, to cause them to kiss one another. A really old pastor said it this way. He said, if you don't see from the gospel that justice and mercy can kiss each other, if you don't see that, then your conscience is either going to lie uh, in a deep sleep in the devil's arms, is the way he said it. You're either going to be in a deep sleep in the devil's arms, or else you're going to be rolling seasick upon the waves of your own fears and doubts. Either spiritually sleepy or spiritually seasick. Those are the only two options if we don't see the agenda of God, the plan of God to save the world from the mess, a long-range plan. And so I wonder this morning, which one of those describes you best? Is it a problem with spiritual sleepiness that gets you down? Are you asleep in Satan's arms, as that pastor said? That would mean you're like me, lying about what you really did, me as a six-year-old, excusing yourself all the time. Are you never able to admit the truth about yourself? Do you find yourself always being taken advantage of and taken in by other people because you're naive about what's really wrong with human nature? Do you see God basically as an indulgent Santa Claus who once or twice a year really swoops into your life and gives you what you wish for, and if he doesn't, then he's letting you down? Do you look around the world and is your view of life way too permissive? Do you never see the value of, of boundaries and rules to rein you in and to rein people in? That might mean you're asleep spiritually. You really need to see how the plan of God combines both mercy and justice without any compromise. But it may also be that you're spiritually seasick right now. You're rolling around, as the pastor said, on the waves of your own fears and doubts. And that would mean you've turned up the volume on justice fully. You know God is just, but you've been turning down the volume on grace. And that would mean that you're wallowing in self-hatred. You can't really see how you could ever uh, be loved. You don't see how anyone could ever accept you, let alone God. It may be that you're very cynical and bitter about other people and the world. Uh, you see God not as Santa Claus, but as a, a brutal a taskmaster, a slave master, who's laying on you impossible burdens that you can't carry, and you're, you're really deep down bitter and angry at him. In your life, maybe you're overly strict. Uh, all you see in the world is rules. You don't see any room for grace and mercy. Neither of these is right. Both of these, though, is what Adam and Eve did from the beginning, and both of them are what you and I tend to do today without the gospel. And so let's look here again at Genesis 3.15. Let's remind ourselves that the plan of God is the one thing that can fix the mess in our hearts, that can fix the mess in the world. And let's turn now to the second point, uh, the arrival of the snake crusher. If that was God's promise, how would God fulfill that promise? Who would be the offspring of the woman who would actually be able to crush Satan's head? Now, human history is not, doesn't have a very good track record, does it? Now, there's a reason why uh, it's a cliche statement to say a good man is hard to find. A good man is hard to find. There's a reason why that's a cliche. Because good people, good men, have really been hard to find. Uh, you might remember last week I, I referred in the sermon to a story in 1 Samuel chapter 16 the famous story of when David was anointed as king when he was a boy. And do you remember what happened in that story? Uh, Samuel was sent to anoint David, and uh, the seven other sons of Jesse were paraded in front of Samuel, and they all looked like kings. They all had the royal look to them, and yet God, one after the other, dismissed them. That's not the one. He's not the one. Not him. Until they got down to the last one, the little boy, the runt, David. David wasn't even in the house because his dad didn't think there would be any way that David would be the one chosen by God to be king. And yet he was the one. Now, last week we saw it was because of his humility. It was, it was to show that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. 
But I also want to point out something else about David. And this is something the Bible says about him later. David was, it says, a man after God's own heart. You see, David was chosen to be king in order to foreshadow, in order to show us ahead of time what God would be doing through his son Jesus. David was a man who, by the grace of God, did seek after God with his heart. He, he loved the Lord. He trusted the Lord. He was committed to obey the Lord. And so God chose him over all the people who looked the part of king because God values true heart goodness far more than he values just appearances and just uh, outward skills and abilities. And yet, when you read the story of David, one thing that becomes absolutely clear is even though his, his heart was, was after God, it wasn't always after God. It wasn't entirely after God. David was a son of Adam and Eve, just like I am, just like you are. David traded God in for idols and worshipped other things in his life. David committed terrible sins. David hurt people in terrible ways as king. Turns out, all through the history of Israel, every time that you're reading in the Old Testament and you think, maybe this is the one, maybe this is the, the Messiah, the promised one, the, the snake crusher, every time you're disappointed. Because every time that person seems like a, a man with, with, or with feet of clay, until you get to the very beginning of the New Testament, the Christmas story that you and I love so much. That story began with a, a little girl in the small town of Nazareth. She was probably just a teenager when it happened. And this little girl was alone, probably saying her prayers, when suddenly an angel appeared to her. Gabriel appeared and said to her, Mary, God is about to do something amazing through your life. You're going to have a son, but it's, he's not going to have a human father. You're going to have a son, but it's going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit in you, and it's going to be born of you, but he is not going to be just simply the son of Adam and Eve. He's going to be the son of, of Eve, but the son of God at the same time. God himself, Mary, is going to enter into his world to finally fix it after all those years. Thousands of years before God gave Genesis 3.15 to Adam and Eve. And finally, with that birth announcement, was, was the, the announcement that God was finally following through with what he had planned so long ago. Now, if all we had was that part of the story, there's no way you and I would believe it, nor should we, right? I mean, the story of God being born of a virgin into the world, I mean, that doesn't seem very believable until... You begin to read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John more of the eyewitness testimony of what this boy grew up to be. He grew up to be a man, a great man. If you thought Moses and David and Abraham were great, all of them were sinners. If you thought they were great, just look at this Jesus. Look at this man. He lived a stellar and perfect life. He backed up in everything he said and did the, the announcement that the angel gave of his birth to his mother Mary. He backed it up. He was a son of man, but oh boy, was he ever the son of the Most High God. He lived like God. He showed how God's justice was turned up to full volume and his grace was turned up to full volume, all together in perfect symphony and harmony. One of Jesus' followers, John, wrote it this way. He said, when we saw Jesus, we saw the glory of the only Son of God because we saw him full, completely full of grace and at the same time completely full of truth. Another way to say that verse is, we saw him full of mercy and grace and compassion for sinners, but at the same time, an honesty about sin, an honesty about what is evil, and a commitment to root it out and destroy it. Both of those were in Jesus. Just think about a few of the things that were true of his life. Uh, there was a, an old pastor back in the 1700s, his name was Jonathan Edwards, and he said it this way, in Jesus' life, you see the the conjunction of diverse excellencies. Now, now he's speaking in, you know, 1700s language there, but what he means is you get things in Jesus that go together in harmony that normally don't go together in harmony in people. Things that just don't normally work together, work in Jesus. 
I mean, think about a few of these things. First of all, Jesus was absolutely honest about sin and judgment all the time. Jesus was straight up. Uh, he didn't mince words. Uh, you may not know this, but Jesus spoke about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. About hell. About really raw realities related to God's judgment and God's wrath against human sin. He was really honest. And yet, look at his life. Who was it that flocked to Jesus? Who was it that loved to be around him? It wasn't the people who were smug and self-righteous who thought themselves to be religious because of their own goodness. The people that flocked to Jesus were the worst of sinners, the people with the worst reputations in all the world. They gathered around him and they were welcomed by him. He loved being around them. I mean, those two things do not usually go together. The people talking about hell are normally not the people that sinners flock to. And yet with Jesus, you see it. Another thing in Jesus is he was a man who tasted the depths of sorrow in this world. I mean, there really is no sorrow that human beings face that Jesus didn't face. Jesus did not live a cushy life. He was abused, he was abandoned, he lost loved ones. He faced the, the, the ugliness of, of injury and the, the ugliness of sickness. He was poor. I mean, he, he in many ways ground out his existence. He ground out his life in the most difficult way. And yet, when you look at Jesus, you don't have to get too close to notice, he exudes joy. There's joy coming out of him. There's an aroma of joy around Jesus. People who are with Jesus are eating bread, they're drinking wine, they're having a good time. How is that? I mean, usually that doesn't work, right? The people who are in touch with sorrow are usually not the ones who bring joy, and yet Jesus does both. Another great one to think about is the huge claims that Jesus made about himself. Jesus said some really crazy, seemingly crazy things about himself. He said, I and God the Father are one. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. He says, you believe in God? Well, in the same way that you believe in God, believe also in me. He said, nobody can come to God the Father except coming through me, and if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins. I mean, people who say stuff like that usually are crazy. And we usually know they're insane from the very moment the words leave their mouth. And yet, the people who heard Jesus most, the people who spent most of their time with Jesus, recognized he wasn't crazy. He was the most sane, the most wise the most full of common sense person they had ever met. He was also tremendously humble. He didn't mind being with people who were weak and poor, people who were outcasts of society. He didn't mind that. He was extremely humble, even though he made great claims. What is all this saying? This is saying there is simply no one like Jesus Christ. You can survey all of history. And you will one time after the other be disappointed if you try to make your hero anybody else, including if you try to make your hero yourself. And yet we always try to do it, don't we? I know I try to be my own hero all the time. I try to be the hero of others all the time. And it simply cannot work. Because only in Jesus do we see God himself. God himself at work. Turning up the volume on justice turning up the volume on grace, both of them at full volume, harmonizing beautifully together, justice and grace kissing each other, especially on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, the justice of God was perfectly expressed. And at the same time, his tender compassion and mercy for sinners like me was fully expressed. And so that's why the Bible says there are really only two ways to live. Everybody lives in one of these ways or the other. You either live as if your life is based on a paycheck that you earn by what you do because you have to be the hero, or you live as if your life is based on a gift that you have to receive because only he can be the hero. The Bible says that's the difference between works and grace. And you really cannot mix those two ways of living. They don't go together. They're like oil and water. You have to have one or you have to have the other. It's either 
works and depends on you, or it's grace and it depends on Jesus. When Jesus calls us to believe in him, the exact thing that he's calling us to do is to turn away from the paycheck-based life and to come into the fullness, the joy, the, the rest and peace of a life that's built on his heroic work in our place. Now, I, I discovered this quite a, quite a while ago, this idea of grace versus paycheck, gift versus paycheck, and yet I still find myself having the paycheck mentality cling to almost every part of my heart. And so I encourage you, I've got to do this too. We've got to continually come back to the, the arrival of the snake crusher. We've got to remind ourselves of just how spectacular and incomparable Jesus really is so that our hearts will once again find rest in a deep way. Do you see that this morning? Do you see that Jesus needs to cover you completely or you won't be covered at all? That he needs to come through for you completely or nothing can come through for you? Nothing can come through for this world ultimately. That's the second thing. Now, thirdly and finally today, we want to see the blessing of the snake crusher. There in Genesis 3.15, I don't know if you noticed this, but there's one more detail there. Did you notice how um, God said to the snake, he, that is one individual uh, offspring of the woman, will crush your head one day? But yet he says all the offspring, the plural offspring, every child of Eve or Adam has the opportunity to join in to that victory that that one offspring accomplished. Did you notice that? There's something really awesome going on here. It's really the, 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 the heart of the offer of the gospel. God offers something to us. He calls us and summons us to join into something that he is building. Uh, he, he basically says, I want you, by taking refuge in my son Jesus, I want you to join in my fight against sin and against evil. I want you to join the fight. I'm making enmity between you, O snake, and the offspring of Eve, meaning I want all the offspring, everyone who will believe in me, I want them to join in too. And by joining in, they have the assurance that they're not just joining in on their own steam. Okay, it's all grace again. They're joining in on the basis of me sharing freely the victory that I accomplished for them. That's why in the New Testament, uh, Paul in, in Romans chapter 16 is able to say to a group of early Christians, very soon God will crush Satan under your feet. Right? Right? Because Jesus, through his death and resurrection, crushed the head of the snake, by faith in him, you've got to believe in him. You have to take refuge in him. But by faith in him, you too will one day see Satan and all evil and sin and death and everything else crushed under your feet. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament in Isaiah 54 says it really well. He says, you are my people. No weapon formed against you will prosper. No word spoken against you can be successful because you're on my side. That's what it means to become a Christian. I wonder if you know that. Uh, whether you've been a Christian for years or whether you still aren't sure if you believe in Jesus or whether you don't. I wonder if you understand what it is Jesus is calling us to do. When Jesus says, come to me, believe in me and follow me, do you think he hands you a piece of paper that says, congratulations, you're now retired? Or, congratulations, now go get busy to work for me and hope, you know, good luck. I hope you can do it well on your own. Or, do you see what Genesis 3.15 is saying? That when Jesus calls us, he gives us a paper that says, congratulations, the victory is mine, secured and sealed for you. I am sharing that full victory with you. Now, join the fight. This is not a retirement letter. This is a deployment letter. Christians receive deployment orders. We go to the front lines. We, we, we live our lives daily on the line between sin and grace, sin and obedience, between good and evil. And we're called to take our stand there, but not in our own strength, to take our stand there because of what Jesus has done. I mean, just think about two great blessings, two great aspects of the victory that Jesus won when he crushed Satan's head on the cross. The first one the Bible talks about is forgiveness. God forgives you of all of your sins, past, 
present, future, when you put your trust in Jesus. He gives you a clean conscience. Why does he do that? Why does he wipe the slate clean for us completely? So that we would now be able to come out of hiding, so that we would come out of the darkness and be honest about who we are, so that we would be able to see sin and evil accurately and to boldly with all of our hearts stand against it and strive against it. You see, the the victory of Jesus shared with us gives us the ability to be deployed into the fight. The second great blessing is when Jesus rose from the dead, he gave every believer his Holy Spirit. The very Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us and works that same power in us. Why does he do that? The Bible says he does that so that you and I would learn that our lives are no longer about ourselves. You do not belong to yourself anymore. Your life is not yours to direct. Now that you have the Holy Spirit, you get to have a bigger vision of your life. Your life is about serving Him. And so standing on the front line between good and evil just simply means this, asking yourself the simple question, what does God want me to do in this situation? And then going to His Word and asking the Holy Spirit to show you from His Word what He wants you to do and how He wants you to do it, and simply committing. It's as simple as this. God wants us to simply commit to little acts of obedience every day, just simply for the joy of it. For the joy that we have received now a victory that we didn't earn. We have been brought into a world of blessing that we certainly did not deserve. That's why in a famous passage in the New Testament, it says God has given us in Jesus full armor. Ephesians chapter 6, the full armor of God, helmet, breastplate, belt, shoes, shield, sword, so that we can stand against Satan's schemes. The schemes that he's been using since the garden the schemes that we've all bought into and that has destroyed the whole world, but now the schemes that have been absolutely defeated for all time through the snake crusher. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy today, your kindness to us. But we thank you also, God, for your justice, Lord. And that all throughout history, you've been actively at work expressing both of those. And often we have no idea how both of those go together. But when we look at Jesus, we see it. We see Jesus on the cross dying because our sins deserve death. That's justice. Lord, and dying on the cross also because God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's grace. Thank you for turning the volume up on both. Help us, Lord, to live like everything good we have is a gift of sheer grace. Help us, Lord, to join the fight, simple obedience every day for the sake of your name. Or we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please sing out with us again as we worship. and shadow restlessly hold labors waiting in silent hope for the promise it longs to know what heaven holds This 
babe wrapped in a cloth is the incarnate word of God. Oh, the kingdom in its power, resting now in this child, Prince of heaven, Jesus, hope of the world. This means mercy in fullest form. Christ the Lord. Hail the Prince of Heaven comes, angel choir sound the call, for this babe wrapped in a cloth is the As we close our service today, we want to turn again to God in prayer. Uh, You know, nothing good in this world happens apart from God's plan of justice and mercy and grace. And so that's why we're going to ask God to work in our lives and in our world. Uh, At the end of the prayer, I'm going to recite again the Lord's Prayer, a very short prayer that Jesus taught us how to pray. And that's for you at home and maybe even for your kids to be reminded of what prayer is all about. Prayer is really at the bottom very simple. Uh, Prayer is simply us asking our Father to intervene in our lives in ways that, that we can't. And so please join me now as we pray and call on Him. 
Father, we thank you so much that, uh, Lord, you have had a plan from the very beginning, a plan uh, filled with both your justice and your mercy, a plan to send your Son to fulfill all of your promises. Every promise is yes and amen in Jesus, your Son. And so, God, we thank you that you sent him and that now by faith you share the victory of Jesus with us, that all evil is crushed under Jesus' feet, that no weapon formed against your plan or your people can possibly prosper. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us confidence in that, confidence and boldness to to work in our lives, not out of fear, not out of doubt and unbelief, but out of faith. Lord, we ask today that you would be with those who are sick in our community and around the world, that you would heal them and comfort them. Father, for those who are vulnerable, that you would protect them and that you would continue to stop the spread of COVID-19. We thank you for the ways that you've you've been working in that that regard. We ask you to continue. Lord, as uh, our state and various places in our country begin to reopen slowly, Lord, we ask that you would be at work, that you would uh, restore us back to work, God, that work is a good thing, a gift from you, and that you would give us uh, all work to do. Father, that you would protect us as we reopen. We ask for our healthcare workers and first responders in our community and beyond, that you would continue to give them wisdom and endurance, skill and compassion as they care for those who are in need. And Father, we want to pray today for our church and for the other churches in our community and the surrounding area, that we would continue to be the church even during this time of of quarantine and, and, and separation, but that, Lord, we ask you that you would enable us to be able to have a plan to safely gather again soon. We, we miss that, Lord. We miss seeing each other. We miss communion together. We miss hearing each other's voices and worshiping together, and so we pray for a safe reunion as soon as possible. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, and now we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if your faith is in Christ, your whole life is based on God's extraordinary gift through Jesus Christ, that he came into this world to crush the head of the snake, the head of the serpent, Satan, so that you and I could share the victory. So receive that blessing today and the benediction, which comes straight from Scripture. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his peace and thank you for joining us at Greater Hope Church.